How information travels between star systems. Yes, this is this is where it gets to me really intriguing and kind of brings us right up to the threshold of exobiology in in, in what you were just saying. Um, and that's, I think, could be, you know, a topic for another discussion that we have. Um, because that's one that really does intrigue me, the idea that, you know, life is spreads throughout the universe. But you I do. also, I want to show this, uh, this connection with Oumuamua, because yeah. we've had three, now three ISOs, three interstellar objects. Oumuamua is the first in 2017. Borsov came in 2019. That was solar minimum. And now we have a uh, three eye atlas during solar maximum. Well, solar cycle 24 was quite weak. Uh, it was the weakest in close to like a hundred years. And this was getting near the end of the descending phase of solar cycle 24. Yet we had the biggest solar flares of solar cycle 24. These are double digit X class flares when Oumuamua did its perihelion, its closest approach to the sun. So on the top right, you'll see that that was on the 9th of September. And then with this um, solar imagery on the left, 131 angstrom view, September 4th to the 11th, we'll see these sunspots just go super, super active. And the first one is like a, I don't know, like a 10 point something X flare. Like these are both double digit X flares, which are the biggest. And we haven't seen mm. any of that size since this. And one day, uh, or sorry, uh, well, yeah, one day after that, one day before that perihelion for Oumuamua, there was also the biggest earthquake of 2017, which was in Mexico in 8.2. So whether it's just a coincidence, it's like a kind of like a cosmic convergence where you get the biggest solar flares, you get this interstellar thing flying in really close to the sun, it cut within the orbit of Mercury. Uh, and at that time was when it was effectively aligned with the ecliptic plane. And we get these huge solar flares in the direction of Oumuamua because it cut in front uh, in between the sun and the earth. So it's like, it's just too much to kind of chalk up to coincidence in my mind, but right. everyone, anyone can make up their mind there. But this was and like the, well, just the key is that this was the end of the descending phase for solar cycle 24. So things had really been ramping down. And then just like that 06 graphic, sunspot numbers ramped up and we got the biggest flares. Like it's, it was very atypical. In the aftermath of the, the the video that I just showed, um, this was uh, on space.com. They did an interview um, about sun diving comets, solar storms, and I'll just quickly quote from, from sort of the mainstream view. A huge solar eruption that occurred right after a comet plunged into the sun was likely a coincidence, experts say. The so-called sun-grazing comet streaked toward the sun Saturday, October 1st, and disintegrated after getting too close. The sun then unleashed a massive eruption of solar plasma, known as a coronal mass ejection. Uh, and then uh, in a one of the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory, one of the uh, scientists working there, quote here, said, there still remains zero evidence for a link between sun grazing comets and coronal mass ejections that can't be better explained than by simple coincidence. Um, and I don't know how many times I've encountered coincidence as being an explanation for multiple phenomenon. Um, but you know, look, there's a role for skepticism and there is a role for that because on the other end of the spectrum, we see uh, too much extreme gullibility. And certainly around Comet uh, 3i Atlas, we've seen a lot of that. <laughs> a lot of it. I'd like to ask you something. Are you using ground news yet? The Vantage plan that I am using, I have found to be extremely useful. As part of their tool set, I can filter stories that are relevant to my research. For example, a new story was just released about a Hubble telescope discovery of two massive cosmic collisions 
uh, between a couple of objects at least 37 miles in diameter near the star Fomalhaut. There are 34 sources uh, that cover this story, sorted by factuality and political bias, which I find to be very helpful when trying to understand any prejudices uh, of the source. I get all my breaking news from Ground News, and you too can enjoy the many benefits of the Vantage plan I use for merely five bucks a month. That's 40% off for my listeners when you use the code here, here, or here. And by so doing, you'll support our work here at Squaring the Circle. Thank you, and now, back to the show. Um, it's been very interesting, though, because it's been... A, it, we don't have all the answers with 3i Atlas, and ideally, we would have launched the Juno probe from Jupiter to do a rendezvous with it, uh, yeah. because they're already planning on deorbiting it into Jupiter. But, you know, NASA can move very, very slow on some things and maybe doesn't have enough fuel. I, I don't know the full story, but I think it would have been well worth it to, to try oh, yeah. to do a, a 3i Atlas flyby as best as possible. Um, but we're, we're learning a lot about conditions outside our solar system with 3i Atlas based off of its spectroscopy data and the, the ratios of what's enhanced, what's not enhanced. So the carbon dioxide being greatly enhanced, the water being there, but not the same enhancement, the huge enhancement of nickel compared to iron and some of these other things and the changing colors, um, indicating that this, this idea has really kind of stuck with me. It's, I, I would, I would put money on this, but who knows that three I Atlas was once a short period comet that got really heavily thermally processed before getting flung out. And then it accumulated a lot of material, like a crust of interstellar material um, during its long transit through interstellar space. It showed up red with a very dark red color, mm -hmm. just like what we see from objects beyond the heliosphere. So our own trans-Neptunian objects that go beyond like Sedna or Maki Maki and other comets can show up with like a dark red color and D-type asteroids are from out there as well. They, they were from out beyond our heliosphere and then they somehow got transported in. They are really rich in organics, amino acids, nucleotides, even on, uh, maybe you saw this new story that just came out. They did a sample collection of asteroid Bennu, which is a B-type asteroid, which is not enhanced with these organics compared to, let's say like a D-type asteroid or a trans-Neptunian. And they've still found huge amounts of water and brines, mm -hmm. the nucleotides, amino acids. They also found these complex gums, they call them, which were co combinations of amino acids, which were unique. So they were not the proteins that we know of for life, but they were complex amino acid protein structures. And that was found on a B-type asteroid. A D-type or a trans-Neptunian is going to have even more of these sort of organics. And the, the evolution of 3i Atlas turning from red to green and the, how the elemental kind of composition of its coma changed is indicative that it was really, really heavily enhanced with these materials, at least on the crust, and it's been volatilizing that out. Um, so just like, there's just so much that we're learning about this. And there's been studies where they put moss in space and the moss was able to survive for a long time, even like mm -hmm. plants. and you know, the little gummy bear tardigrades or whatever you call them. And it seems that life could also be moving between the different systems due to these sort of uh, objects and ISOs and more. And uh, so I think that's another reason why people are so interested in, in this, because it's also speaking perhaps to, to that and how energy and information travels between star systems and more. How information travels between star systems. Yes, this is this is where it gets to me really intriguing and kind of brings us right up to the threshold of exobiology in in, in what you were just saying. Um, and that's, I think, could be, you know, a topic for another discussion that we have. Um, because that's one that really does intrigue me, the idea that, you know, life is sp spreads throughout the universe. Uh, and and is not limited to 
in fact, doesn't even perhaps uh, undergo its genesis in a planetary environment. Perhaps a planetary environment provides the optimum, at least like Earth, for whatever. I don't know how many other Earths are going to be out there. We're discovering there are Earth-like planets, but they're different enough that if there's life there, it's probably not going to be life like we would necessarily expect to find. We're not going to see a reflection of ourselves. But we do see, you know, like the, the, the Goldilocks model. I mean, it seems like Earth is optimally situated for the formation of higher life. And if Earth is thought of as a matrix and the precursors of life are introduced into this matrix, and it just happens to have the right combination of gravity, of mass, of elemental uh, composition, has enough water, etc., has a has a satellite that can help to stabilize the Earth in its uh, you know in its orbit. Then we get we get the evolution of higher life, which is to me very much uh, still an outstanding mystery. Uh, but we're we're learning things that you know we didn't even think we were capable of learning a few generations ago. So it is exciting times. I would say. You know, since I've still got this quote open, the this this the skepticism came from a scientist at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. But the SOHO scientist, which is what the um, the, the the solar observing heliocentric, uh, what is it? you remember right off SOHO? It's you were pretty close. It's something like that. Yeah, solar observation heliocentric. Uh, I don't know what the other O is for. But SOHO, so this, here's what the SOHO scientists wrote. And they're kind of leaving it open-ended. The question of whether a sun-grazing comet can somehow trigger a coronal mass ejection is an intriguing one, SOHO scientists wrote in a website update this week. So far, the feeling is that the apparent relationship between some comets and some mass ejections is simply one of coincidence. But notice they're kind of inserting those caveats there. Ah, it's an intriguing one. So we're not dismissing it out of hand. And then by saying, well, so far. But, you know, if you've got one example, if you only got one data point, you know, you can't extrapolate from that. You're going to need several. But it looks like we have several examples now. Maybe and, we should have. And there's a lot more, too. We could, we could find more. <laughs> yeah, we could find more. That's the point. So... Then, then the uh, coincidence basically goes out the window, and we've got to look for some kind of a coherent uh, system going on here. It's um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, we are getting to that point now where we're looking at things much more holistically and realizing that these are not separate, uh, disconnected systems, but there is a whole. Um, a whole matrix of interactions amongst the sun, the planets, the, the, the fields of plasma that suffuse our solar system, uh, the magnetic, uh, the geoma uh, geomagnetism, obviously, you mentioned that earlier, has a, a important uh, component of this system. And maybe all of these things need to integrate in, in some fashion that basically allows us to be sitting here having this conversation. Hold on a minute. You've made it this far and you haven't hit the like button or the subscribe button yet? Please rectify this omission. You almost left without leaving a comment. If you're so inclined, please leave one because we're interested in your thoughts about the show that you just watched, the clip that you just watched. If you enjoyed the clip, the whole episode can be found here or in the description below. And if you enjoyed this content, YouTube thinks that you're also going to like this video as well. So check it out and we'll see you soon.